Hey everyone, I know it's been a while since I talked to you all about a history of facial plastics, but we've spent the last few weeks moving everything into our new office uh, and it's open and we're really excited to see you. And I thought I'd continue on with some more interesting stories from history of facial plastic surgery. So the two individuals I'm going to be talking about today are Archibald McIndoe and Harold Gillies. And all this information that I'm going to be talking to you about comes from two sources. The first is by Murray Michael called Reconstructing Faces, The Art and Wartime Surgery of Gillies, Pickerel, McIndoe, and Malin, published in 2013. And a book by Robert Simons entitled Coming of Age, A 25th Anniversary History of the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And that was published in 1989. So Harold Gillies was a New Zealand-born ear, nose, and throat surgeon who moved to the United Kingdom for medical training. He wound up in France on the front lines early in World War I at a time in which about 15% of soldiers fighting in trench warfare experienced facial trauma of some kind. He later moved back to the United Kingdom where he settled at Queen's Hospital in Sidcup, Kent, and he spent most of his wartime operating experience there. That was from 1917 to 1921. This hospital was incredibly busy. Over 8,000 procedures were performed between 1917 and 1921, and 2,000 of those, or one-fourth, came from one battle, the Battle of the Somme. Also interesting about the hospital was the fact that they removed all the mirrors in order to reduce the chances that the injured soldiers would see their uh, malformed faces. During this time, uh, Harold Gillies compiled all of his wartime experience and published The Plastic Surgery of the Face, which was a foundational text and the basis for many contemporary reconstructive techniques. There is something to note about this book, however, and that is he did assert some things that are later found out to be uh, not viable when it comes to surgery. Specifically, he promoted the idea of using cow cartilage to reconstruct the nose. And he continued to promote this idea even after the concept of transplant immunity was discovered. He had a busy practice after World War I, and it became even busier as World War II approached. When World War II approached, he settled down in Rookstown House um, where he opened the plastic and jaw unit in 1940. And he became very, very busy after the evacuation of Dunkirk. He was a practical joker. He actually would dress up like an old man and wander the hallways, and he would walk up to individuals who were interviewing for jobs at the hospital and strike up a conversation with them and talk about things other than medicine. He liked to talk about rowing and fishing. And when they'd have a conversation, the conversation was over, he'd reveal himself and uh, let them know that they'd been interviewed and whether they got the job or not. He'd also dress up in disguise to philanthropic events, and when speakers would toast him, he'd hide under the table um, to make everyone feel awkward. He also had a younger cousin, and that younger cousin's name was Archibald Mickendo, and he really facilitated Archibald Mickendo's rise through the ranks before World War II. So he started working for Harold Gillies prior to World War II, and eventually took over Harold Gillies' position as the primary consultant for the Royal Air Force just prior to. He worked at Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead during World War II, and it's important to note that at the time of World War II, there were only four plastic surgeons in all of the United Kingdom, and each of them were given a hospital, and his hospital was East Grinstead. Um, in East Grinstead, it was Queen Victoria Hospital. Interesting thing about him was that he maintained his civilian status during this whole time period in order to eliminate the concept of rank and, and help boost morale amongst the people who worked at the hospital. He changed the color scheme of the hospital into brighter colors to help improve patient morale. And he would actually encourage townspeople to come and socialize with patients in order to make them feel better. Now, it's interesting about the patients he, he took care of. They would actually meet year after year to toast Archibald McIndo long after he died. And they called themselves the, uh, the guinea pig club. And you can imagine why they would. Um, but his patients really loved him and appreciated him. So I think two of these two men, these giants in the field of plastic surgery, I think one of the more important things to recognize about them is how much they cared about the mental health of their patients. And I think that's something we have to constantly be aware of when we're taking care of ours.